The opening sequence of episode 5 essentially just drives home what I already mentioned last time. The first half of it is absolutely identical. It recaps what happened during the first attack in Shiganshina and how while Maria fell. Though unlike last time where Armin's narration was cut off, this time it continues as we move to the present and the colossal reappearing. In essence, it carries the message of, that is the history we know, and now let's see whether it is repeated. The attack on Shiganshina will of course continue to be a major throughline for the rest of the season, and is a part of the story we'll be returning to time after time. Though considering where this episode is headed, I do think that in terms of setting up that shocking ending, this one managed to do it very neatly and right under our noses as, for the most part, it is a repeat of what we've seen already, and the deeper meaning of it only becomes clear in retrospect. As for the title of the episode, First Battle, The Struggle for Trust, is pretty self-explanatory, though it still has some dimensions that I think many may overlook. The easy way to look at it is that this is just the first battle for the recruits, so this title speaks to their first outing in their respective military branches. Though in the wider story, it also implies that the tide has indeed changed, as this time, this is referred to as a battle. This in turn implies that what we saw in Shiganshina was purely slaughter, but now, after five years, enough has changed for it to warrant a different perspective. A battle, because this time, Paradi is fighting back. And similarly, in hindsight, we can also call this the first battle in reference to the Titans specifically, and the war between Marley and Paradi, as it's here where we learn that Eren is also a Titan shifter himself. With this in mind, while Shiganshina was simply an attack where no one in Paradi could resist, this time Marley is actually met with some new resistance, both because of the intel gathered from their first attack, as well as Eren's Titan who suddenly changes the game completely. So yet again, a seemingly simple title packed with quite a few different perspectives. Moving into the episode itself, perhaps not surprisingly, it opens right where we left off, moments after the Colossal's appearance and Eren standing on the wall. The first thing to note here is one that Eren points out in the show as well, the fact that the Colossal immediately targets the cannons. This is essentially the first bit of concrete information we have that these two are more than just an abnormality and that they do in fact operate with some sort of plan. And with that, the attack on Shiganshina is already recontextualized due to us now knowing that there was intent behind it. And I also want to point out the music choice for this sequence. Note how it switches from that pulsing, almost drums of war type music to slow and somber strings. Almost as if we were in Eren's minds and that realization of, wait, its intelligence hit us as well. Put yourself in Eren's shoes. The Colossal appears and finally you can use your training to take it down. But then suddenly, you realize that this is not a mindless monster and that its next move will be a calculated retaliation. And so what was supposed to be triumph suddenly turns to dread and even hopelessness as the magnitude of the situation sets in. It will not be as easy as slicing its nape. This one is not fueled by a blind rush for blood and it clearly operates with intent. And I know this is pretty difficult to do in retrospect, but remember that initially, while we clearly knew that the Armored and Colossal are different in the sense that they both possess some sort of extraordinary abilities, intelligence was never a given. And with the music I mentioned before, the combination of this completely overwhelming power combined with intelligence paints a very bleak picture for Parody. Though aside from the story implications, the animation here is simply excellent. The entire sequence of Eren flying around his arm and then running to the nape is just so so fluid. And I also think that seeing Eren actually run along the Colossal's arm is super important because it finally gives us a very explicit size comparison between the two. We have of course heard that the walls are 50 meters high, so clearly the Colossal should be even bigger than that. But by portraying Eren as almost a fly buzzing around this behemoth of a creature, that sense of scale becomes much much more clear. 
And do know that these sorts of size comparisons will also pop up later in the series, where if you actually compare their sizes, they will not be accurate in-universe. But the show opted to use perspective to convey the overwhelming size of the Colossal. Though that is a debate for the future, and let's not rush our heads. Another thing to note here is that we see one of the Colossal's core abilities demonstrated in this fight. Its ability to rapidly produce steam by burning its own muscles. And while this ability would be of vital plot importance later in the series, I do think what we saw here is a very rare thing in the series, but that is indeed a plot hole. Because here, he literally vanishes, something we would never see again. In fact, later in the series, we'd even get the confirmation that no matter how much the Colossal burns up its body mass, the bones are never affected, and that would be the entire premise for defeating the Colossal. So, in this case, Berchold vanishing into thin air is simply impossible, as the carcass of his titan should have still remained. In my opinion, I think this is just a case of Isayama having like 90% of the Colossal's abilities thought out, but missing that vital 10% that would be the skeleton left behind. Because obviously, the rest of the sequence does make perfect sense. The whole rapid steaming thing is its core power after all. I do think that from a meta story perspective, this was done to compound that mystery of it literally just vanishing and building up that feeling of it transcending any and all reason, but in-universe, I do think that this is a contradiction and simply a minor plot hole. Though the last thing I want to note here is what this spells out for the rest of the story. Because in this case, Eren has a literally perfect shot at its nape. Everything lined up for him to bring it down. But it still meant nothing. No matter how much they train, the shifters are beings that invalidate everything they know and they'll require a much much different approach if they are ever to be defeated. And more on this in a second. Returning to the story, a world building detail that I thought was really clever is what we see right after the Colossal's inexplicable disappearance. Moments after the confrontation, we hear that the protocol for the Colossal's appearance is in motion and that, above all else, Aaron should immediately return to headquarters and report every single detail he can. This is one of those small things that could have easily not been there and no one would likely notice, but the fact that this sort of protocol is immediately referenced just makes the world feel so much more real. Because of course, everyone would be doing their best to prepare for it again, even if they have literally zero information of what that might look like. It's almost like we have governmental plans for zombie outbreaks, alien invasions, and other similar very out there scenarios. It just makes sense for them to prepare in any way they can. If it means saving one extra life, it was worth it. And in a broader sense, this also calls back to what Aaron said in the last episode. With each and every defeat, they will learn and that strategy advantage will begin to manifest. So having Aaron immediately report every single detail to HQ further drives home that idea that things may slowly be changing in favor of parody. And that is also showcased as we see the evacuation of Trost, very much evoking the events of Shiganshina. Only this time, while yes, there is panic, we are very explicitly shown that things are different. There are soldiers who can fight the titans. There are people manning the walls. There are preparations to defend the gates, and so on. That strategic advantage is finally beginning to matter. And again, you can also link this back, or I guess forward to what we'd hear in Season 4, where Marley is worried about exactly that. Other nations getting technology to exceed the power of the Titans. And Parody slowly adapting is a micro-scale example of that exact worry. Though because this is Attack on Titan, obviously it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Because all of that is contrasted by Armin. Perhaps not surprisingly, he is extremely scared for himself. Though I don't think it's as simple as him being afraid of fighting the Titans. Rather, I think it's him realizing the bigger picture. The way I see it is that he is noticing the pattern. While everyone is hyped up about defending Trost, Armin quickly realizes that it took like 10 seconds for Trost to be infiltrated, and if the Armored finishes the job and breaches Wall Rose like it did Maria last time, there is only one wall left. 
Sure, they may fight off the titans that flood into Trost, but the Colossal is nowhere to be found and they clearly can win against it. Not to mention the seemingly completely random nature of these attacks. Suddenly after 5 years they just popped up again. So it's not Armin being scared of the titans, rather it's him fearing for humanity as a whole because he is the only one in the room who realizes the sheer magnitude of the situation. And to further drive home that fear, we cut to all the recruits' bodies that already paint a very bleak outlook for the mission. Aaron does of course jump in and tries assuring Armin that things are different now, but that fundamental clash of emotions will continue to be present through both this episode as well as through the entire Trost arc. Though as we fade away from Armin and Aaron, we get the scene of the Titan's destruction as we see the breached gates and embers flying across Trost. And moments later, that is sharply juxtaposed as we fade over to an extremely picturesque view where the embers are replaced by rays of sunshine and butterflies peacefully flying across a flowery field. And with the sequence we'll be diving into in just a moment, the contrast between the out-of-touch nobles living in ignorance of what is going on and the soldiers giving their lives to protect them will become very, very clear. Though a very similar sentiment to Armin's is seen as we cut to another very intelligent individual, Commander Pixis, or Pixis, I still don't know how to pronounce it, but anyway. We see him playing chess with Lord Bart, a noble, though their game is interrupted as Pixis gets a report that the Colossal has breached trust, and it's at that moment that his facade is broken. I will always enjoy stories dunking on arrogant nobles that are too dumb to realize that they are the ones being played, so this is already a brilliant scene on that basis alone, but it's then that we see Pixis finally stand up and get serious. The contrast between the noble who's yelling like a small child about his own life versus the Chad Pixis who calmly explains that he's fighting for all mankind is super tropey, so I don't think I really need to elaborate on that further. Though I do think that one of the crews telling Bart to his face that, on the battlefield the commander has no need to hold back, was both very intriguing since at this point we have no idea who Pixis even is, as well as just satisfying because again, dunking on nobles is a ton of fun. And of course, big brain Bart realizing that all of their chess games was Pixis just letting him win to make him happy is just some good fun. Following this, we get another mid-card, this one focusing on the cannons we saw atop the wall. I think this was just another great world-building detail to showcase how Parody has adapted to the unique threat that is the Titans. Again, it is a small detail, but in the world of Attack on Titan, the whole cannons on rails that can be pointed straight down at the wall just makes perfect sense in the setting, as it allows them to hit their napes without ever having to fight the Titans themselves. Though returning to the story, we hear that the Vanguard has already been wiped out, and with the Elite Squad being posed right at Wall Rose, it's clear that everyone is expecting the armor to appear at any moment. And this time, they're given only one goal. Defend Wall Rose until all civilians are evacuated. Considering the human loss from the Colossal's last attack, perhaps this isn't that surprising. If their population keeps dwindling at that rate, soon there simply wouldn't be enough people to ensure that society even keeps going, let alone for there to be enough people to fight the Titans. Though before we cut away from headquarters, we get another very, very cheeky scene. We see Jean essentially just air out all of his frustrations, asking why the Colossal had to attack today of all days, since literally the following day, he would have been safe in the interior. And the person standing behind him is of course none other than our boy Bertolt, the person responsible for the entire thing. As we discussed last time, there is likely a very long list of reasons why they chose to attack this day specifically, but the fact that while Jean says this, Berthold is literally looking over him as an almost looming force is very on the nose, and is another detail that will likely give you a big smirk when you rewatch the series. And another character-centric moment we see here is from Historia. Just like with Potato Girl a few episodes before, it just continues the trend of Historia's selflessness when it comes to basically anyone and everyone. This is a super minor scene that doesn't really hold any meaning in the episode's overall narrative, 
but I do think that it's just subtly planting those seeds of, hey look, see how Historia is constantly looking after random people? Considering the martyrdom we'd see from her later in the series, I do think that these background scenes consistently showcasing that were a nice little addition. Though returning to Jean, we see him bump into Aaron, and as you'd expect by now, this means another heated debate. In this one though, Aaron takes the lead and yells at him to think back to everything they've been through already, telling him that he'll survive and he'll be just fine in his inner wall tomorrow. In essence, it echoes that scene we saw in the graduation party where everyone was a little taken aback by Aaron's passion and had their spirits bolstered by his dedication. Only problem is, we all know how this episode ends, and so in retrospect, unlike all the previous times where Aaron rightly pointed out how short-sighted Jean is, and that if they don't fight, everyone will die, this time we know for a fact that Aaron is the naive one, because no matter how much he yells about their training and everything else they've been through, absolutely none of that mattered. Not his spirits, not his ambition, not his dedication, zilch. He was devoured all the same. Obviously, he is a titan shifter, so of course he would still be alive. But in terms of Aaron as a plain old human, his wannabe soldier persona did ultimately get him killed, plain and simple. And it's moments like these that made me want to start this sort of retrospective series to begin with. Because of course, with hindsight being 2020, we know that yeah, Aaron got what he wanted. But at the same time, while he is right in certain instances about fighting back, he is still very naive, and that is on full display in this episode. Though hold that thought for now. After Jean leaves, we see Mikasa walk up and tell Aaron that if things go south, to head right for her and that she would protect him. Considering everything we've seen from Mikasa already, likely not surprising, but yet again hammering home the core of her character's motivations. And this of course would be further strengthened in the following episode. Though we also hear that she has been moved to the rear guard, or in other words, all the elites protecting the wall in case the armored shows up. And now you might want to get a little bit of tinfoil, because I know this is a stretch. Because the following scene is something else entirely. After she's told to move, she tells Aaron that depending on how everything goes, things might not go according to protocol and that she'd just protect Aaron. Though when Aaron gets angry asking her how can she be prioritizing what she wants, that being Aaron's safety above all else, over humanity as a whole, she admits that she wasn't thinking clearly. She then composes herself and says fine, she understands. And um, is this not literally the final season? Even when Aaron activated the rumbling and the wall titans began their march, Mikasa was still on his side through and through. And it was only after Annie outright asked Mikasa whether she could kill Aaron and prioritize the rest of humanity over him, that her message seemingly finally broke through. And just like we see here, Mikasa realizes that she's not thinking clearly, and Aaron is no longer the priority. I delved into all of my theories regarding the final arc in the first episode, so I won't rehash all that here, but I suppose only time will tell whether these scenes do in fact parallel the very very end as well. And as usual, to those familiar with the manga, please don't spoil me or anyone else in the comments, thank you very much. And also, this isn't anything super major, but I just love the whole, please don't die scene. It's a fairly common trope in apocalyptic series, but when it is executed right, I think it can pack a lot of emotion in just a few extremely simple words. And again, considering how this episode ends, it does of course also carry a very different tone on that basis alone. Aaron, however, responds that he won't and that he can't afford to die here. And here, I feel like you could interpret the scene in a couple of different ways. The first one is the simple one. As Aaron himself says here, he still wishes to explore the world, so it's a case of his ambition basically saying that he's got other things he still wants to do. Though the other is good old future Aaron. Clearly, he can't afford to die because he still has a mission to complete. To defeat all of his enemies and to ensure the safety of Paradis. Though regardless of how you read this scene, it is also further setting up that shocking conclusion of the episode, which we'll get to in a second. The interesting thing here is that before we follow up with all the titan threats and trust, we fade into a flashback where we hear a whole bunch of lore regarding the titans. 
In short, we hear that generally speaking, the Titans are not driven by any purpose aside from sheer bloodshed, they do not have any reproductive organs and don't seem to reproduce at all, and that most of them appear to have masculine features. In hindsight, considering all the information we were given, when it comes to the Colossal and Armored at least, it almost seems obvious that they are in fact human as they do not abide by the simple-minded nature of all the other Titans. Even when we see the Abnormals, all of them still operate with zero plan. And the wording they choose just makes that even more obvious. The Titans do not have the capacity for intelligence like humans. And then you look at the Colossal and Armored who do have the capacity for intelligence. Like humans. Because they are humans. When it comes to the pure Titans on the other hand, while I do think that there was a chance to just blindly guess that they were actually people as far back as this, I do think that this early on, there is just a lack of evidence to support such a claim. Obviously the whole they don't reproduce part does make you wonder how do glorified giants just appear out of the blue then? But considering how we've seen very little of the setting, basically any kind of magic shenanigans could have been used as an explanation here. Especially considering that either purposefully or just because of a plot hole, the Colossal did indeed just literally disappear. In retrospect, on the other hand, we know for a fact that even the whole the majority of them have masculine traits parts was purposeful. As if we look at the flashbacks in Season 4, a vast majority of the Eldia Restorationists were men. And on top of that, the dude who'd eat Aaron at the end of the episode is even sitting there listening to the Restorationist plan back in Marley. A minor detail, sure, but one that makes the entire history of the world just feel much more real, even down to very minor side characters. And the last thing we hear in this flashback is just some last minute exposition about Titan regeneration and the whole targeting the nape thing. Though the thing I loved with this last bit of the flashback isn't even what it says, but rather the transition, as we cut from Armin and Aaron in the classroom to them being on top of the rooftops. Just a really clever way of incorporating a flashback to function as a lore dump, while portraying that as Armin recalling his training and preparation of the mission. When it comes to the story on the other hand, we once again see Aaron laugh it up saying that they'll have their first successful campaign and move up the ranks quickly. And it's here where the absolute brilliance of this episode truly begins in my opinion. We see that classic upbeat vibe that we saw in the training arc just a couple episodes before appear once again. And that triumphant theme plays as we see their skills on full display. Obviously, the ODM animation here is simply excellent, and the use of both 3D environments and 2D animation for the characters is extremely well done. I'd go as far as to say that this sequence of them running atop the roofs before launching off again with the ODM gear is still among my favorite sequences in the entire show. But when it comes to building up a false sense of security, this clearly excels in that. Every single thing that's being shown to us leads us to believe that things have changed. As the lyrics of the opening say, the hunted will have finally become the hunters. That is, of course, until no more than 30 seconds later, an abnormal jumps up and devours Thomas. And again, note the music. Suddenly that triumphant theme fades to complete silence as we watch the dread set in. And for what is, I think, the fifth time, the Colossal's theme once again cuts right through that silence, almost as if telling you, no, that shonen vibe we've been talking about in episodes past, that is gone. This is no fun game. There will be no climbing up the ranks and teasing each other about points. This is life and death. You can forget about your heroic music because you are in over your head. And I think the Colossal's theme here signifies all of that beautifully. And as if all of that wasn't enough, it's then that the series goes pedal to the metal and just hammers home what I just said. We see Aaron, in your most stereotypical protagonist fashion, fly off to fight on his own. And once again, the series is like, nope. You screaming louder won't make you any stronger. As a titan jumps up and chomps one of his legs off. 
We've talked a lot about the tonal differences in the early episodes, and I think this one is one that encapsulates all of that. Because we are shown very directly that this blind rush will get you absolutely nowhere. Though before we follow up with the story implications of this, I also want to mention the animation again, because yes, Aaron's advance is so, so fluid. Just like I've mentioned already, I absolutely adore these shots where the camera continuously tracks the character's movements and swivels around them to maintain that feeling of velocity instead of constantly changing angles. And this one is exactly that. Once again, it flies right behind Aaron, then curving around to see his enraged face, then pulling back to see the view of him soaring above a tree and sending leaves flying in front of the camera, and then of course, the money shot. Him going under this tunnel. And what makes this whole thing even better is the sequence of him after losing his leg. Because there too, we see him fly from roof to roof to roof, just smashing through one building after another, and we do not cut away. It's one continuous shot. It just gives the whole sequence we saw moments before have that oomph, as we see the speed and weight behind his movements actually thrown against something. It's just a perfectly executed action scene in my opinion. Every single bit of movement in it just feels weighty and super realistic. As for the story though, obviously the fact that the protagonist just lost his leg in literally his first mission 20 seconds into his charge should already leave you asking many questions. Especially when taking in the context of the story we've seen so far. And I fully expected to be roasted alive for saying this, but this is one of those things that anime will always have over the manga. Because no matter how well the story is written on paper, these sorts of extreme juxtapositions are so so much harder to pull off without music, dynamic scenes, and everything else that comes with an animated format. I'm speaking in broad terms as I still haven't read a single chapter of Attack on Titan, so for this case... My source is that I made it the f*** up. But I am ready to die on this hill. With the animation quality of Attack on Titan, these sorts of scenes will always feel better in the anime, simply due to having so many extra degrees of freedom when it comes to music, movement, camera angles, and everything else of that nature. Anyway, that's my hot take for today. Returning to the story, continuing on that feel of this ain't no shonen and no one is safe tone, we see the rest of Eren's squad go down one by one. And suddenly, Armin is right back to that paralyzing fear we saw earlier in the episode, with all of that coming to a boiling point as the bearded titan swallows him whole. And with that, we drift into another flashback and oh boy, is this an interesting one. We see Armin run up to Eren super excited about an illegal book that he got detailing the outside world. First off, they talk about how it says that the vast majority of the world is covered by an ocean. Or in other words, salt water. To which Aaron responds, No way that's true, you could make an absolute fortune selling salt. Obviously, since they live in a relatively small landlocked region, their access to basics like salt is extremely limited. And while that is a great world building aspect on its own right, it more so leaves you wondering, Wait, why is learning of the outside world illegal? Armin mentions some of this in the first episode already, saying that everything concerning the outside world is considered taboo, but broadly speaking, so far we've been led to believe that the reason why so little of the outside world is known is because of the Titans. Yet here, we are learning of a book with several descriptions of what it is like, yet it is outlawed. So now you're left asking whether the source of the Titan threats could come from inside to begin with. If you could make a fortune off of selling something as simple as salt, and you could hide the truth from the general public, surely you take advantage of that, right? In retrospect, we of course have already found out all the answers, but on initial viewing, I still remember the countless theories people were throwing out about everything regarding the secrets both within the walls as well as the outside world. I think it's scenes like these that really did a lot to both give you hints about the state of the wider world, while still leaving you with several possibilities as to what that truth is. So yeah, just a ton of fun to reflect on now that we have all of the answers. Though as we return to the present and move into the final minutes of the episode, we get what is absolutely another highlight in the series, as Aaron gets back up and jumps into the Titan's mouth to save Armin. 
Number one, we of course now know that this isn't just him acting like a Giga Chad, but also his Titan regeneration and vitality kicking in to save him. Number two, the whole sequence of him saying, as if I could die in a place like this, is another one that in most other series would signal that, through some shenanigans, he'd managed to get out of the Titan's mouth. Whereas here, that is not the case at all. And while he does of course still survive this whole ordeal, when it comes to this episode's overall narrative, that through line of juxtaposing his drive with complete and utter defeat is very much there. Number three, this is another scene that you could also attribute to him receiving specific memories, especially considering that we as the audience also just saw a flashback concerning the outside world. So it's also entirely possible that this whole final charge into the Titan's mouth was also fueled by a very relatable sense of purpose since it is literally coming from himself. And lastly, and most importantly, the way his quote-unquote death is handled is pure excellence. Just how nonchalant the entire scene of him getting ripped apart right in front of Armin is just describes Attack on Titan perfectly, even with him never even finishing the sentence of his last wish. And then there's the soundtrack. Once again, the intense music fades to complete silence for a second. <laughs> but is then replaced by the bells ringing out and the choir that was once in the background now coming to the forefront. And all of that is exacerbated as we see the darkness fall upon Mikasa following Eren's quote-unquote death. I think the only word I can use to describe this entire sequence is the word biblical, and no, this is not a trash taste reference. If you've seen Death Notes, you know all the scenes of the choir kicking in and the whole righteous judgement thing. This is the type of feeling I think this sequence carries. Though speaking of Mikasa, another thing I want to note here is one that I also mentioned in the previous one, that being weather. Because notice how this time, it does in fact change. The entire Aaron sequence takes place on a sunny day with those same relatively clear skies. Though as he is eaten, or I guess to be more precise swallowed, dark clouds begin to set in to signify that the core driver of their resistance is seemingly gone. Because remember that the whole reason why Armin, Mika, and a long list of others joined the recruits to begin with was Aaron. And so with his death, that light is extinguished and Parody is enveloped in darkness. And from a character perspective, all of that rings particularly true for Mikasa, as her one guiding light is now also gone. And what hammers home that idea even further are the following episodes where Trost is shrouded in those dark clouds. That is, until Eren's attack titan makes an appearance, and a glimmer of sunshine finally shines through the clouds. And once Eren is rescued, we see those same, mostly clear skies as the sun sets on that tragic day. Though let's not rush ahead. Again, in retrospect, all of us obviously know that he is perfectly fine throughout all this, but I think you'll agree that on initial viewing, this was just like, wow, they seriously just did that. Though with that, that is the end of episode 5. Yet another one packed with brilliant animation, a whole bunch of foreshadowing, and some of the greatest twists in the early parts of the series. I think it's following this point that we basically get into the attack on Titan we all now know. As at this point, almost all of the show's core mysteries have been established and tonally, we've been slammed in the face with the brutal reality that is the world of Attack on Titan. Though yes, with that, next time we'll be delving into the aftermath of Eren's demise and one of the most important flashbacks in the series, Eren saving Mikasa, as we continue over analyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. I'm convinced at this point that these will never be shorter than half an hour long. I mean, this one was mostly set up, but it still turned out to be 35 minutes long. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, David Bear, Profi206, and Finn. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye